Live. Ed, can you hear me here? Yeah, I can hear you, Dennis. There you are. How are you doing? I'm doing great. All right. These guys are going to let me know when we're we're on the net. We are on the net? Oh, all right. Well, hello, greater viewing audience on the web. We are here at the MSNBC Experience in Charlotte, North Carolina for the 2012 Democratic National Convention. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here. <laughs> And for the next hour, we're going to be talking with Mr. Ed Schultz, uh, who is in New York City at 30 Rockefeller Plaza and is uh, in the radio studio there. Uh, much of this chat is going to be carried uh, nationally on his uh, on his radio show. So, Ed, how you doing, buddy? Doing great. It's good to be with you. How's everything in uh, Charlotte? It is beautiful and busy and crowded and uh, exciting. <laughs> well, I see Mike Tate's on the screen here. We got to we got to talk to Mike Tate. Great to have all of you with us here on the Ed Schultz Radio Show, simulcasting with the MSNBC Experience in Charlotte here on this uh, Google Town Hall. Mike, uh, Wisconsin is yes. has Paul has Paul Ryan had any kind of effect uh, on the polls in Wisconsin? Is, and is Wisconsin going to go with the the home sun? Well, let me assure you, Wisconsin is not going to go with the home sun. There is uh, simply, yes, people here are excited to hear that. You know, look, the people of Wisconsin, you know, they, they don't really know much about Paul Ryan. He's gotten a free pass from the local media. He hasn't had a real race since 1998. Uh, obviously, he's got a real challenger in Rob Zervon this time. Uh, but I think having him on the ticket is actually going to be a great opportunity for the people of Wisconsin to actually learn what Paul Ryan's ideas would do and what his vision truly is. Because, you know, he comes off as a – you know, a Packer fan and, and you know, a, a super nice guy and a family guy. But but I think this is the – people are really going to chance chance to learn uh, about what his well, plans would do. I, I think people are curious. Did he just start lying or has he been lying all these years in Congress? <laughs> has he been lying to the people back in Wisconsin for the last 14 years or did he just start when he started hanging around Romney? Well, I, you know, I, I don't know if hanging around Mitt Romney causes you to become a liar or not. Um, you know, we'll leave that for a, a different judge. But he obviously has had sort of a problem with the truth in the last uh, few weeks, and I think that it's a bit of a pattern because, look, this is a guy that's never had his his uh, rhetoric checked. You know, he's never been politifacted. He's never really been held to account. And I think now that he's in the limelight, he is realizing he can't get away with uh, some of the same mistruths and misstatements that he's been making all along. Well, the one that uh, has entertained us here on the Ed Show is the one about the marathon. <laughs> Apparently, he, he was uh, – see, see, now, look, being an ex-jock, I can tell you how much I bench-pressed, okay? Yeah. I, can tell you, I can tell you what my 40 time was. Right. I, think any, I think anybody that runs a marathon knows exactly how long it took them to finish, right. and especially, especially if they're training for it. Because right. if, you're tra if you're training to run a marathon – that means you have to keep track of whether you're getting any better or not. Right. And so the, the host asks him what his best time was, and he can't he can't recite it. He well, can't recite his he can't recite his budget either. Oh, by the way, I mean this guy just it, it, I, I, he's a liar. He's an absolute yeah. across the board freaking liar. Well, I agree with you. And let me say let me say this about his marathon time. My wife has run eight marathons. She's training for her ninth. What's her best time? Her best time is 3:44, so she she would bet bait Paul Ryan in the one marathon that, uh, that that he claims to run in. But you know, you're exactly right. My wife can recite you all the times she's had in every sure. marathon she's run in, and it is yeah. just absurd for him to think that you know he was accidentally dropping an hour when you're running 26.2 miles. So you you we definitely don't want to play golf with this guy. No. Uh, you, you, know, you don't know. I well, mean, he's going to the woods alone. He'll, you know, uh, drop uh, the ball. Uh, that's, that's exactly right. All right. Uh, the other discussion that we've had here the first couple of hours on the Ed Schultz Radio Show today has been how aggressive should the Democrats get at this convention? I, I mean, my personal opinion is there's got to be some us versus them in the conversation. I mean, they have laid it out that President Obama is not American, that right. President Obama has ruined the country that we can't do this another four years, and they have now come around to the 1980 question about Ron, from Ronald Reagan. We're supposed to ask ourselves if we are better off today than we were four years ago. Now, we played a priceless soundbite last night uh, on the Ed Show 
So let's go back four years. Let's go back to <laughs> September of 2008. On September 24th, 2008, Bush uh, addressed the country from the Oval Office and said the country was in serious financial condition. He said the credit markets were frozen, that some financial institutions had already tipped over and there were others that are teetering. And these are his words. He said the country is in a serious financial crisis. Now, if I was uh, on the Obama team, I would tell President Obama in his speech on, uh, on Thursday night to tell the American people that we're not going to turn to an empty chair. We're going to turn to the last president, and you can be the judge as to where we were four years ago, and play this soundbite from the Bush address. Now, you know, the Obama people, you know, they're, I think sometimes, you know, they don't want to, they don't want to diss anybody, uh, and, and they don't want to be uh, arrogant about it. But the Republicans, Mike, are asking the question. The Democrats didn't bring this up. The Republicans brought this up. Well, play him the freaking tape. Play him the tape and the presidential uh, speech on Thursday night. How how would you how would you view that as as a viewer? How would you view that as a politico if the Obama team were to do that? Look, I I, I welcome this debate. I think that this was a huge mistake. I think that it is an unequivocal yes. This country is better off than it was four years ago. We have a ways to go. I don't think anyone disputes that. But four years ago, we were losing eight hundred thousand jobs a month. We have added millions and millions of private sector jobs under the president's leadership. This country is moving in the right direction. But I mean, you know, okay, we're better off than we were four years ago. Where would the average middle class family be if Mitt Romney's president four years from now? I think that's an even better question that we should ask. Well, there's a story that plays into this. I'm going to bring it, uh, bring it up tonight. That soundbite that Bush produced saying that we're in serious financial crisis, in that soundbite he said that the credit markets were frozen. Well, the credit market, what, what, what does that mean, the credit markets were frozen, frozen? He said no lending institutions were forking out any money. Lending was tight. Uh, credit markets are frozen. That, those are his words. Now, uh, that means there wasn't any money floating around for the automobile industry to go anywhere else. They were either going to have to tip over or they're going to have to get some help from the Treasury. And the president stepped up and made sure that they got a loan. And you don't have to look any further than today's news. Number one, he saved the automobile industry. And secondly, uh, Bloomberg News reports today, Ford U.S. August light vehicle sales go up 12.6%, estimated up 8.5%. Chrysler, AP reports today, Chrysler U.S. sales rise 14% on demand for Ram pickups. Auto sales expected to stay strong. That headline would not be produced, that story would not be produced had we had followed Mitt Romney's way and Mitt Romney's business logic on how to do this. I don't think there's, there's a bigger story out there for the Democrats right now when it comes to business because it affected not just a few workers, not a small business, it affected an entire industry. And the job effect in Ohio alone one in eight jobs uh, re relating to the automobile industry. It's like that agricultural dollar, and I know in, uh, in Wisconsin you know about this, that ag dollar turns 11 times on Main Street. Mm -hmm. And I don't think the Democrats can hit this hard enough. And, and I mean, just nail them on this time and time again and chart it up on exactly what kind of effects. This is what I want to see. I, I, don't want, I, don't want, I don't want the Democrats to come up with generic lofty talk. We got the stats on our side. We got the numbers on our side. We have the record of action on our side. And it is a lot of us versus them, and it should be. Besides that, it would be entertaining and get better ratings. Your thoughts? Well, I think that's exactly right. You know, and I think the General Motors is a great example. Obviously, there's a lot of jobs in Wisconsin related to the automobile industry. As we all know, we did lose a plant. We lost it under George W. Bush, not uh, President Obama, as Paul Ryan misstated in the speech last week. but. You know, you also had Mitt Romney out there saying, hey, we need to let the housing market bottom out. We should take no steps to help the average homeowner out there who's lost, you know, $50,000 in the value of their home. I think that there is a whole host of three things where 
you know, look, Mitt Romney just does not understand what uh, average middle class Americans are going through. He sure doesn't understand the average middle class Wisconsinites, and neither does Paul Ryan. Yeah. Mike Tate, good to see you. Own the convention, my friend. Absolutely. Have a great one. <laughs> Have a great one. All right, let's talk to some more folks down there in uh, – in Charlotte. Dennis, who else do you have with us? All right, Ed, we've got a full room here at the MSNBC Experience. I know everybody wants to talk to you. So uh, let's start here with Matthew. Matt. Uh, hi, Ed. Uh, I'm involved with the Young Democrats of America, and a story we always get asked is the enthusiasm gap with young, young voters and, and young activists. And the closest poll I've seen for people under 30 is 24 point margin and they're either that's the closest it's been between obama and and romney and, and the youth vote support right now and so i'm just trying to figure out is why people keep talking about it that way we have 644 delegates under the age of 36 here in charlotte it's a record number um that we've ever had so it's just it doesn't it doesn't seem what we're seeing on the ground doesn't match up with what the stories are well, Matt, here's what you got to watch out for. More lies. If your ground game is good, what do you think the Republicans are going to say? If you're out there organizing in bigger numbers and your voter registration is better, they're going to spin it some way to the point to, to, to their friends in the media that, oh, enthusiasm is down. Uh, look, if there's one thing this election cycle has taught the American people, there's a lot of stuff that just isn't the truth. And people who are in the position of making decisions are willing to say things that simply aren't true to the American people to get that ultimate goal of winning. And so, uh, I, you know what? I, I don't buy any of this stuff. I mean, look at look. President Obama today had a hell of a crowd at Norfolk State University down in Norfolk, Virginia. He spoke for 21 minutes, one of his shorter speeches. The crowd was going nuts, and it was a heck of a turnout there. Uh, in Boulder, Colorado, the same thing just the other day with the president. In Toledo, Ohio, the same thing with the president. I think you can look at crowds. You can get a sense of how people are responding on the ground. And everything else is BS. And, and so uh, that, that's where I'm at on it. Matt, good to talk to you. Thank you, Ed. You bet. All right. We're back. Jules again. Hey, Hi. Uh, Jules Goldstein. I'm an alternate from Minnesota. And... Um, We've got a situation there where we've got a, a good governor who will veto all of the, use your, whatever expletive you want that the Republicans in the legislature want to throw at him. So they're going ar around him by doing rather interesting uh, constitutional amendments. And I'm wondering, how can you run a vote no campaign without being negative? How do you run a vote no campaign? Well, uh, I think you have to think about that person who's going into the, into the booth. What's easier for them to say, all right? And, 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 and reversing, and I'm speaking in generic terms now, reversing the question and coming out with an answer that more people are likely to give you. And in politics, the word no is the most effective thing. The Republicans have proven that. So I, I don't know if I can scientifically, politically answer your question, but that's that's my best shot at it. All right. We have uh, we have more questions for Ed. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, my name is William Flowers. And how do you feel about Fox News and the other uh, right wing media coming down here and talking about the convention and broadcasting live bad things about the convention, the Democratic convention? Well, uh, I don't think it should affect anybody down there because you're the smart people. You know exactly what Fox is yes, all sir. about. Look, uh, Fox has uh, got a mission, and I'm actually glad that you've asked this question because uh, I, I, I want to. I don't get an opportunity very often to uh, explain to people uh, what parameters that I operate under here at MSNBC. I host the Ed Show, eight o'clock Eastern. Uh, I am allowed to have an opinion. I'm allowed to get on the air uh, and say what I believe. I'm allowed to uh, uh, give my philosophy. I'm allowed to give an opinion on a story. But I cannot have my own set of facts. I can't say something that's not true. Uh, I can't report something that uh, is kind of true or just kind of wrong. We're in the exact business. 
And because we are a network that follows and operates under the standards of uh, NBC News, uh, we are still uh, afforded the opportunity in our shows, in our opinion shows, to be able to say what we think. Fox News, in my opinion, is driven by a political agenda. They flat out lie. They have lied. They will continue to lie. They, they have memoed agenda on what their shows are going to do. I have never received a memo from the front office or any of my superiors at MSNBC that have told me, Ed, you are going to do this story. It's the Ed Show. It's my content. It's our team's content. And I am responsible for making sure that our information is correct. And I'm also responsible for making sure that the audience knows that what I say is my opinion is just that. Now, as far as Fox being down there, hey, it's, uh, I'm glad they're there. Uh, I think even some of their viewers are starting to figure out that they're lying because their audience is down. They ought to be smoking everybody. but They ought to have better ratings now than what they had back in 2008 if they're so excited about getting rid of President Obama, but their numbers are off. And uh, that can be easily fact-checked by somebody. Thank you. All right, Ed, we've got a, a bunch of people who want to ask questions here at the MSNBC sure. Experience in Charlotte, but uh, also people watching online. And if anybody watching has a question, I think you can go to the Ed Show blog and, uh, and post that in the contents there, and we'll, or in the comments, and we'll figure out a way to, uh, to get it to Ed. So next question. Benjamin Cope, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I'm a union worker, and I'd like to know what, what Paul Ryan has done to help or what he did do to help keep that auto uh, plant in Wisconsin that he criticizes Obama for uh, letting it fail. What did he do to help hold on to that factory or General Motors plant in Wisconsin? And what does he plan on doing to help in, uh, the union workers? Well, you got two questions there, Ben, and I'm glad you asked the first one uh, on the heels of what we were just talking about. It is a fact that Paul Ryan did write some letters on behalf uh, of the uh, community of Janesville asking the automobile company not to close the plant. That's a fact, okay? So I can't sit here and say, oh, he didn't do anything, okay, because he got pressure from his constituents and he did communicate to General Motors saying that he wanted them to take a different path. Uh, on the other hand, he also requested stimulus money, which, of course, uh, his party didn't vote for, except for, what, three Dem actually two Republicans and one Democrat who switched over, and that was Arlen Specter. So he's got a record of, number one, spending money. Uh, number two, he did try to... Uh, I guess in some kind of a minor fashion, try to stick up for the plant. But when it comes to union workers and when it comes to the concept of collective bargaining, even in his own backyard when collective bargaining was on the table recently in the Wisconsin recall and everything we've been through in the Badger State for the last two years, he was a no-show. He was a no-show to support workers. He was a no-show to support collective bargaining, and he has a record of that. And so he'll fit right in with Mitt Romney, who's probably one of the biggest union busters the Republicans have ever put up uh, on their ticket. That's how I see it. Audio? Dennis? Okay. okay, we've got Danny here. Danny? Hi, Ed, big fan. Uh, I work on national security in Washington, D.C. at a think tank. I'm just wondering, with Obama's clear national security advantage, he made the decision to go after Osama bin Laden. His sanctions against Iran have dropped their currency more than 50 percent. They've been very, very successful. He's been extremely uh, kind to veterans and military families. Can you talk a little bit about how the Obama campaign needs to capitalize more on its national security advantage going into the election? Well, I think uh, considering the fact that the Republicans didn't even mention Afghanistan or Iraq or even give a shout out to the troops at their convention, I think it gives the president a, a real political opening here, but also a moral opening. That is, uh, much involvement as we have around the world, and after 10 years of war, uh, he needs to make the case and restate the case to the American people that what he campaigned on is exactly the direction that he's taking. And he is also needs to point out that when he came into office, it was undecided as to what we were going to do with Afghanistan. And the president 
pressure from the Republicans, listened to the generals on the ground and went with a surge in Afghanistan to the delight of many Republicans because they thought that that was the answer in Afghanistan. Now we are back to where the president wanted to be with a drawdown date and a real target for us to disengage uh, and do more counterterrorism in that region than to have actual troops engaged in any kind of combat missions. So the president has knocked it out of the park. Last fall, Sean Hannity said the president didn't want to get bin Laden. I think the president needs to bring that up, that uh, there's actually news commentators out there making the case that President Obama didn't want to get bin Laden, that he really didn't want to do it, which is hogwash. It was the Bush administration that disbanded the unit that was looking for Osama bin Laden, and it was President Obama who reinstated the operations to go get the bastard. And that's exactly what they did. And so, th really, the Republicans, they have no uh, up in the conversation on this president or the Democrats when it comes to foreign policy and when it comes to what is happening. I mean, look, uh, jointly, the world disposed of Gaddafi. We didn't have to go in and play police officer. And I think that one of the things that uh, uh, the American people, by poll after poll, is showing we don't want to be the police officers of the world. International intervention has cost us our infrastructure. International intervention has cost, cost this country a lot of ill will around the world. And the way Obama has pieced it back together slowly shows that we're a good partner. And this hogwash that's out there about Israel not having a good ally is maybe one of the biggest lies that's out there by the Republicans. Benjamin Netanyahu has stated himself that he is more than pleased with the way the president has handled the Middle East situation and the commitment that the United States has towards Israel. So the wedge that has been tried to uh, been thrown into this progress that President Obama has made on foreign policy is just a dead end for the Republicans. I, I think the president re needs to restate the case on Thursday night about where we are in Afghanistan and what we're going to do and what our mission is. The country's tired of war. We're tired of international intervention. It's proven to be the wrong path. And that's exactly what the Republicans were talking about last week at their convention. All right. Hi, Ed. How you doing? My name is very, Frank. How you doing? Very, very good. Thank you. My name is Frankie Kidd, and I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. And I have a question for you. I'm reading a game-changing book that's called Bulls, Bears, and the Ballot Box. And Ed, that book has really changed the way I think about this country. And my question is, um, the Republicans have held the office of the White House for 40 years and the uh, Democrats. Why do you think Democrats don't do a very good job on standing on their message? Because the reality is they have been better economic stewards for our country. They have been better for the middle class and the working class. But I don't think they do a great job of standing on the message that they are better economic stewards for our country. So I'm just wondering what can we do to help spread the word? Like I said, the book, Bulls and Bears and the Ballot Box, changed my thinking. So I'm trying to get an understanding of how we can be better at getting our message out that um, when the middle class, when Democrats are in office, everybody does better, just better for working class Americans and um, middle um, working class Americans. So I just wanted to ask you that question and also Godspeed to you and your family. I well, thank you. I appreciate that, Frankie. Thank you. I'm going to, I want to know more about the book you're, you're, you're reading. You gave me the title, but what, get, get it, give me this little detail. Okay, so this book, which is called Bulls, Bears, and the Ballot Box, and it reviews 80 years of the presidents, our president. Right. And it starts with Herbert Hoover, and it ends with George W. And ironically, for 40 years each, the Democrats held the White House, and 40 yeah. years, the okay. Republicans held the White House. And while they were in office, the Democrats, we did better when Democrats were in office. I mean, I think there's the myth out there that we do better economically. It's better for our pocketbook. We have to vote our interests. As working Americans, I think it's so important that we vote our interests. And I don't know why people vote against their own interests. And I'm just trying to think what we can do to, you know, to get that well, message out. Well, let, let me uh, let me shed some light on it from this perspective. The world changed in uh, February of uh, 1996 
when the telecommunications bill came down. And uh, I don't I don't mean to speak uh, to talk heresy right now, but the fact is, media ownership is a huge issue in this country. And basically, the conservatives did not have the microphone, and the conservatives now have the microphone. Ninety percent of the electronic media in this country is owned, operated, and programmed by conservatives. And only in some parts of the country can you get liberal talk radio. Now, there's satellite, of course, and then there's uh, internet broadcasting, which is starting to take off a little bit more. The concept of what we're doing here today is pretty much uh, cutting-edge stuff and uh, the wave of the future. But the fact is, is that in 1996, when the ownership of radio stations, and the reason why, and I'm not saying I'm partial to radio, but it's a fact. 98% of Americans listen to some form of audio every single day for the consumption of news. And when you have got 450 right-wing talkers spread out all over the country, which is driven by an ideology and not so much a business model, you're going to be influencing a lot of people. And the only thing that's going to reverse that, and I think we're seeing that in this election and somewhat in 2008, is the social media and, and is the information age evolving to something that's much more direct to consumers instead of having a middle interpreter? And I th think we're evolving in the information age and politics is now figuring out how to exactly, you know, move information in a way that's going to get rid of the filter. And it's going to take time for us uh, to, to mix the ground troops together, the social networking, the messaging, and be able to go directly to consumers and directly to the people. Uh, but in 1996, uh, ha I'm a firm believer, had the telecommunications bill not come down in 1996, and if the, and if the conservatives have not, did not grab the microphone the way they did and damn near every market in this country, I'm not convinced that George W. Bush would have been elected. Well, he stole the damn thing anyway from down there in Florida. But you know what I'm talking about. Well, you're right. He did. <laughs> and I want to say, finally, thank you for being a great American. And I hope you get a chance to read the book, Bulls, Bears, and the Ballot Box. You have a great show. You're a great lefty. And thank you again. Thank you, Frankie. I appreciate that very much. Thank okay. you very much. All right. What's your name, sir? Ed, my name is Ken Parlier, and I live in Columbia, South Carolina, home of Nikki Haley. And um, I'm sure you saw her speech last week at the convention. Um, I did. And she is, of course, one of the leaders in the voter suppression that's going on with the right. And I wanted to get your comments on that, seeing that uh, Nikki Haley is a uh, – she has her right to vote because of the hard work and of, of the women's movement that's gone on in this country and the civil rights movement in the last 40 years. And I'd like to hear a few words from you about that. Well, look, uh, I think voter suppression, I've said this numerous times on the Ed Show, is the biggest story in this election. Uh, we're going backwards. We used to be in a country where we wanted people to vote, where we made sure that minorities could vote. We made sure that uh, the Voting Rights Act took place. So it was a revolutionary thing in the 60s. We, we made sure that, that women could get the right to vote. Uh, it, it was called progress. And it's very clear that the Republicans are on the wrong side of the issues, and they know it. They know that they favor the wealthiest Americans, and they're trying to concentrate the wealth and the power and the corporate power as much as they can. And so uh, being behind the eight ball, so to speak, they're trying every trick of the book. And it's just by coincidence that some 26 states have put voter ID laws on the books with Republican legislatures and radical Republican governors who want to do everything in the world to suppress the vote, saying that there's a tremendous amount of fraud out there. there. There's no fraud out there to the point that would call for any kind of legislative action. And so... Anthony, I think we just lost uh, Ed Schultz. <laughs> so I would take him a... That's what I, mean. I think he was giving that microphone a run for its money and uh, probably the... Uh... Google Hangout line as well. So in the meantime, what is your name, sir? Uh, Richard Keep Smiling Greer from Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> and we have fans of the Ed Show here, the Ed Radio Show. Do you guys listen? I just wonder. 
The show is the, 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 the Google Hangout is being broadcast on his radio show as well, as you can tell from the, uh, the microphone in there. So I think that uh, he's probably still yapping away on, on the radio, and we're, we're here waiting for him to come back. So we'll just pretend this is a commercial break and maybe play some music or something. Anthony's, if you want to, no, let's just hang out and wait. Are you on the line to them? <laughs> there we are, by the magic of technology. I, I'm sorry about that. I don't have the, the, the nice fingertips that know how to hit all the keys, and normally my elbow hit the wrong one. Just please be careful with the equipment. <laughs> no, no, I'm not one of those guys that trashes equipment, Dennis. You know that. <laughs> oh, and I'm not one of those guys that fills time when the uh, time <laughs> goes down either. All right, we're back. We're live. Here's the next question. Yes, Richard Keith Smiling Greer from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, basically, I know you get this question all the time, the two-part question. First part is, how do you feel President Barack Obama should present himself on the middle class as far as what can be brought forward in his new term? Well, I think the president has made a pretty strong case in this campaign that, uh, you know, he's got the middle class in mind. I think they delivered tax cuts to the middle class. Uh, he has, and he is not going to go after the middle class uh, when it comes to uh, tax increases in the next four years. He's made it very clear that he thinks that uh, shared sacrifice is where it's got to come uh, to get our treasury back in order, and obviously that is uh, getting the wealthiest Americans to pay more and going back to the old rate. And so I, I think the president is uh, a populist in this regard. The majority of Americans believe that the wealthiest Americans need to pay a little bit more. And, and I, I think at this convention, there's going to have to be some tough talk. I, I don't think that there's any idea that the Democrats are going to come up with or any idea the Republicans are going to come up with that are going to fix where we are in the short term in this country. In the short term, we have to do something about the Treasury. And the reason why we've got to go back to the old rate is because the wealthiest Americans have had the breaks over the last 10 or 12 years in an economic model that has not worked, and they have the ability to pay a little bit more. And for the good of the country, they got to put country first, and they got to do it. And that doesn't mean that we can't make cuts. We are making cuts. Uh, we're, we're making cuts in foreign policy when it comes to forking out billions of dollars every month to Iraq. Those operations are being scaled back tremendously. And this is going to save us a bunch of money. And there's other areas where we can also trim the budget. But it, it, it's going to have to be shared sacrifice. And I think the president has made that case uh, re really well. So I, 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 don't, I don't think making the case on the middle class has been a deficiency at all, Richard. Okay, my last question is, can you help a 65-year-old veteran, Vietnam veteran, retiree, get a ticket to the convention this evening? <laughs> My friend, I got no pull. I'm in New York. <laughs> Thank I, wish, you. I, I wish I could, but I. I uh, All right. Uh, if uh, anyone want to ask a question, yes, we have next question. Okay, I have my ticket for tonight. Uh, my question or comment is, why aren't we talking about how good? Obama is for small business because every time you open up the auto plant you open up all the businesses around the auto plant and those are all entrepreneurs and small business people so we really need to be taking away small business as the issue that the Republicans think they can own what this do you think about that? I, I think you're spot on I also think if you check the record this president has uh, done more for small business than the last two presidents. This president has put initiatives that affect people's paychecks right on the table uh, for small business. I think he needs to outline that. And you're right. I, I, I would not allow the Republicans to have the upper hand in the conversation on small business when they've got nothing but a record of obstruction over the last four years. They've done nothing for business, nothing, except run around saying that the engine of America is small business, yet they've done nothing for it. Uh, and I, I think the president's got a good record to run on, and I think you're right on that. The automobile loan is the, is the biggest story out there economically. 
uh, for President Obama. Let me tell you something. If this automobile loan had not gone well, believe me, the Republicans would have pointed it out. Uh, if there had been the continued job loss and this loan had not worked, uh, it would be the, the death of his presidency. I mean, I, I don't think we really realized what financial condition the country was in before President Obama got in there. And I think they, they need to remind him at this convention with the soundbite of President Bush. But they also have to explain the trickle-down effect and the residual effect that it has in small business of what they've done to the plastics manufacturers, to the electronics, to the rubber, to the glass, to the steel, to all of the things that go into the components upholstery of making uh, an automobile and what it's done. And also point out that the workers have taken a haircut, that this just, just wasn't uh, some new management style, uh, that the guys stopped flying their jets into Washington and they just decided to drive their own cars. It's just not that. The, the workers, the unions took concessions. They took concessions on retirement. They took concessions on health care, and they took major wage concessions to make this work. And turning it around, now they're getting bonuses now that this has all worked out. So this has been a great partnership between the automobile industry, the Treasury, the government, helping out when all the other markets were frozen. And that does trickle down to small business, and I think it's an easy case for the Democrats to make here. All right, we're taking questions for Ed Schultz. If anybody wants to come, I, I would just ask you, the, the, the big question that we're seeing this week is, is back again. Are you better off now than you were four years ago? How do you think the, uh, the Democrats need to answer that question? Well, I think they need to start to answer it by playing the Bush sound cut of October or September 24th, 2008, when President Bush, that's four years ago this month, and uh, he detailed the serious financial crisis that we had in an address from the White House. Lehman Brothers, Lehman Brothers had tipped over two weeks before this uh, comment in, on September 24, 2008. Lehman Brothers, an American institution that goes all the way back to the days of the Civil War. That's how long Lehman Brothers has been around. Lehman Brothers, let's see, they went through uh, the Vietnam War, the ups and downs of that. They went through recessions. They went through the Depression. They went through two world wars. They went through the Industrial Age. Lehman Brothers! They're no more. I mean, that, that, I mean, come on, an American institution tips over. It's been around for since the, the, the 1870s, 1860s, and th we're trying to be told that the Bush economy worked. I would start there. That's where I would start with that question, Dennis, and I would just systematically go right down the calendar on what happened each month that President Obama uh, had to deal with this, and I would point out how much obstruction – and how many no's there were over from the Republican side. Uh, th that's, that's where I would go with it. All right, we have another question. Yes, I would like to know, um, how is it that the Republicans at this time have such a regressive agenda on women at a time when women have broken so many glass ceilings? And tell us how the president has championed women issues. Well, uh, first of all, about the suppression of the vote. This disproportionately hits women, and this is an undercovered story. The voter suppression laws that have been put in place in this country disproportionately hit elderly women, disproportionately hit the single moms who are working the two jobs, who are uh, trying to raise the kids. That I mean, you know, the social engineering of it all, it is demographically targeted at women to suppress their vote. And now that's what they're doing in that regard with the minorities as well. And then over on the other side, they are they have numerous governors have put forward radical legislation when it comes to chipping away at choice. And so this is really the big picture. The, the, the Republicans have done a great job over the years of generationally setting goals and reaching them. Uh, they, they set goals not just for an election cycle, but they try to set goals for the next cycle and the next cycle. And what are you going to do in five years and 10 years? What are you going to do in a generation of 25 years? And they've been masterful at that. The president, uh, I, I think, has got a very strong record on protecting women's rights and, and making sure. I mean, the, one of the first things he did was equal work, equal pay. The, the Ledbetter Act. I mean, 
how could anybody be against women being paid equally in the workplace? Well, leave it, leave it to the Republicans. Leave, leave, leave it to the Republicans that think it's okay for a woman to make 77 cents on every dollar a man makes. Uh, and then you look at the voter suppression, how it's targeting women as well. I, I think the Republicans are, they're, they're back in the 18th century. So let's go back to Dennis. Dennis, is that a friend of mine you've got standing next to you? I, I think it might be. Oh, yes, it is. Uh, I was wondering, did you get a new girlfriend? I have not been on the show. No, no. <laughs> Senator Lena Taylor, great to have you with us on the on the Google t Town Hall it chat. Great to be with you, Ed. Great to be with you. I tell you what, we have become great friends. She is a real fighter for the people wherever she goes. I've got great respect for this lady and. She could probably speak to the issues a heck of a lot better than I can when it comes to women's rights and what's happening. And just how radical, Lena, all of these Republicans have been in attacking women in the last several years. There's no question about that. You ask who could be against, you know, equal pay. Uh, the Republicans that are in Wisconsin that were in control, who undid the legislation that we did to protect equal pay, and a governor who signed it named Governor Walker. Those are some exact, some exact examples uh, of individuals who are against it. And it really shows that the Three Stooges, the Ryan, the R Prince, or I'm sorry, Rince Revis, uh, yeah, Revis or whatever his name is. I can't remember. I always always call him Prince Revis. That's what I always call him, which is not his name. So anyway, as well as not just Paul and not just uh, him, but Walker, that you're able to see what's come from Wisconsin. And my question for you, Ed, was now that you've seen the Republican National Convention and you've heard Ryan speak and you've heard the lack of truths that came from Ryan in his speech, can you share for your listeners and for those of us that are in this room the comparison that you see with what happened in wisconsin and really what it says to the nation number one they're shameless it doesn't matter what the subject it doesn't matter how big a lie they have to tell they're going to flat out do it and they have confidence that they've got the financial backing that they can make people believe exactly what they're saying i don't care if it's on a state level a local level state level or a national level. The platform of misinformation is, is, is it is gut-wrenching to see, but this is how they are waging their war against workers, against women, and trying to control the government. There is no lie too big for these people as I see it. I got to ask you, Lena, Senator, did you see Scott Walker lie to me on TV the other night? You know, I did, and I wasn't surprised that my governor lied yet again. He's been lying ever since he got elected. Actually, he's been lying since he was an undergrad and got kicked out for lying. Well, I, I, I asked uh, I asked Mike Tate earlier, and I'll ask you, Was uh, has Paul Ryan always been a liar, or did he just start lying when he got around Romney? Well, if I can be honest... Paul Ryan has probably always been the way that he is. Uh, and more importantly, he's always been someone who seems like, in my opinion, that he's trying to push grandma over the edge. You know, when you talk about giving a voucher in the Medicaid program, it really says that we're saying to our seniors, hope that your health outweighs your voucher. You know, your health goes longer than your voucher goes. And Ryan is being dishonest when he suggests to people that he's committed because he gave his had his mom on the podium with him. It doesn't make it right. So yeah. I've known Paul Ryan to, you know, he's a normal guy, but, you know, he is in a party that chooses not to be honest. Senator, what do you expect out of the Democrats at this convention? What do, what do you want President Obama to say? How aggressive should he be? Should it be an us versus them? Uh, where, where do you want to see this convention go? I hope that he's going to speak, first of all, in a way that pulls the entire nation together. I, I think that's number one. Um, but more importantly, I hope that he shows the stark difference that exists between the three R's, the Romney, you know, the Ryan, you know, and their reverse policies compared to himself and his administration with Vice President Biden. 
I think that he has shown that he deals with the tough issues, and I hope that he's going to talk about that, that he's taken on the tough issues. Healthcare presidents for 90 years, right, have tried to deal with this issue, and he took it on. And that he does it in a balanced approach, not an approach like what Governor Walker did and what, frankly, I think the Republicans show that they want to do, which is to rush things through, regardless of input from constituents. And frankly, I hope he'll go to the wall, Ed, with it. So when you say, will he be aggressive, I hope that he will be honest, straightforward, and that he will go to the wall speaking those issues. And I'm hoping that Michelle will show that Ann Romney has nothing on her. There you go. Senator Lena Taylor of Wisconsin here on our Google Chat Town Hall Center. It's great to see you. You too, and we're praying for your wife. God bless All right. you. Thank you, Lena. I appreciate that very much. All right. Dennis? Yeah, we've got, we've got more questions here, but I do want to take one uh, that's coming in from the Internet. Anybody that's watching on our Google Plus Hangout can, uh, can do questions on the Ed Show blog. Uh, Ed, this is uh, Senator Joe Lieberman's last DNC. What do you think his farewell address uh, is going to sound like? Well, actually, I think they ought to dedicate one night to getting rid of that guy and do uh, four hours of primetime coverage of how grateful we are that Joe Lieberman is now leaving. Uh, yeah, I, I just don't, I can't understand why the people, the Democrats don't like me anymore. Let me tell you something. This guy has been the biggest thorn in the side of the Democrats. And we would have a better health care bill today if he had been loyal to workers, if he had been loyal to families. Uh, and, and I tell you what, I think he's going to go down in history as one of the most unbelievable turnarounds in, in the Senate. How in the hell did this guy get on Al Gore's ticket in 2000 and turn out as bad as he did within the next five years? I, I, he, he's not a Democrat. It's all about Joe, and the people of Connecticut can't wait to get rid of the guy. And we should have, in fact, there ought to be a Lieberman parade celebrating his departure from the Senate. <laughs> All right. All right, Ed, we have uh, Ed. Yeah. Here you go. How's it going, Ed? Good. How you doing? <laughs> On a lighter note, um, I'm Ed O'Brien. I have the privilege of being the youngest Democratic delegate uh, in New Jersey. I'm only 18. Thank you. My question for you, Ed, is what's your opinion on the future political um, leadership that the Democratic Party at the national level can provide to young folks like me? And, you know, where do we go from here for young guys? Well, uh, what are you looking for? Let me let me ask. You. I mean, that's uh, I appreciate your question. It's it's you know, it's it's rather broad. But let me answer it this way before you comment again on this. Um, I, I think the Democratic Party has got a great philosophy, uh, history, and reputation of creating opportunities for people. And I will take just this issue: the Pell Grants. It's right in this election. President Obama wants to expand the Pell Grant opportunity for college students. Candidate Romney wants to cut them back. That's what's in his budget. So I think what, what you should be looking for is upward mobility and are there uh, engines in place to get you to the next level. Education is the key, I think, to us succeeding as not only a country and not only as an individual, but as a country. And I think the Democrats have protected the infrastructure and the funding of education for years. Governor Christie, if he would be the nominee in 2016, you would have clearly uh, the biggest warrior against any of the Democratic institutions that have been put in place to give young people an opportunity. Uh, just in the Obama years, the health care bill, if you're under 26, you can stay on your parents' uh, health care plan. This is huge, especially in a slow economy. When kids come out of college, they're riddled with debt at the age of 22 years old. The last thing they're ready to do is start paying a hefty health care bill of 80 or 90 or or $100 a month. That's a lot of money to somebody that's just starting out a student that is going to be strapped with debt. And so uh, I think just those two things alone, when it comes to health care, when, uh, when it comes to education opportunities, the Democrats have got the young people in mind. First-time homebuyers, 
the first time you buy a home in America. That too was a democratic, uh, that came right from a, a democratic ideology and a, and a democratic platform. Uh, women's rights, uh, women's rights, the, 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 the right to choose and equal pay. I mean, do women who are in their 20s, do they want equal pay as guys who are in their 20s? So those are just four things that, that off the top of my head that where the Democratic Party has got a solid reputation to give the younger generation a good jump start into a career of their endeavor. The Republicans don't have that. I would agree fundamentally on that to everything that you mentioned. Uh, as someone who's trying to figure out how I'm going to pay the tuition bill for this semester uh, at my college at Lafayette, uh, it's so true that the importance of the Pell Grants, the importance of you know having that uh, health security, you, you hit everything. Well, there's, and there's one more thing, too. It's just not long ago the Republicans tried to raise the interest rate on your loan, and the president fought back and made sure it didn't happen. Now, that's a fact, is it not? That is a fact, Ed. There you go. I can want to thank you for this, and I hope you enjoy your stay in Charlotte if you come down. Yeah, you bet. Thank you. And the, I think the other thing that Demo for the younger people, I think the other thing the Democrats are going to do is make sure we don't invade anybody on false intelligence. <laughs> okay. Uh, All right. Next question. Oh, Ed, love you, buddy. Thank you. <laughs> My wife and I are teachers, and uh, I'm gonna. I got a question for you. Just want to let you know, I've been hearing that Democrats aren't fired up. But you know what? We're fired up. We're ready to go, okay? Fired up, okay? I'm a teacher. I'm a union guy. I'm a veteran. And my question is, I mean, what kind of hit me hard the other day was Romney didn't mention veterans, didn't mention Afghanistan. He didn't, you know, he did, of course, didn't mention George W. Bush either. You know, what do, you know, how are we going to get that, that word out? They lie all the time, but they also lie by not, by what they're not talking about. Well, uh, let's go back to your profession, if we can, for just a moment. Uh, the Republicans had numerous speakers uh, at the podium at their convention that attacked teachers. I mean, it was just, a, you, you, let's see, we had Jeb Bush go after the teachers. Uh, Walker didn't do it, but Kasich went after the teachers. And uh, Christie went after the teachers. You know, you're the problem. Did you know that? Did you know that you're the problem, that, 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 that you have just become this big problem is why uh, we're not making uh, headway in education in this country? Although it's okay to cut 6,000 teachers in New Jersey uh, increase the class size, take a billion dollars out of the budget. And I, and I don't mean to embarrass you here. Uh, this is a, a pat on your back. I, how long have you been teaching? 22 years. I would bet in the 22 years that you have gone into your own pocket, you've gone into your own pocket to make sure that your classroom has the required supplies, whether it be pen, paper, pencil, what. Have you ever had to do that? Have you ever done that? Yeah, my wife and I both have spent a lot of money, of our, of our own money. Yeah. Of course, we're only there to destroy students' lives, right? We didn't yeah. get in that to help yeah. anybody. Yeah. And, and, of course, we, you know, I, I, I'm going to be flying to my yacht after this down in the Caribbean. <laughs> and, you know, I'm really sorry for the horrible person that I am as a teacher. You know, I'm going to tell you something. I don't know why all of a sudden the Republican Party has decided to vilify teachers. And uh, I commend you for what you do. My mother was a high school English teacher, and I know teachers today are working just as hard as my mom did. Uh, I, I, I know what it's uh, – I've seen uh, my mom stay up late till wee hours in the morning grading papers and lesson plans, and uh, No Child Left Behind has been put on your shoulders, and it's uh, uh, really been uh, – a, a revolutionized elephant that's in the room that can't be moved because I really do think that the Republicans are trying to destroy public education because they want to get rid of the voting block and they want to make sure that they can uh, concentrate the wealth and only educate the people that they want to educate and it's going to have a lot of the income challenged neighborhoods across America are going to fall into the category of failure and I think they're okay with that I really do yes they are <laughs> all right all right, I think we have just a couple of minutes left with Ed Schultz, so time for one more question. Stand by. What's your name? 
Hi Ed, my name is Liz Schuler. I'm the Secretary Treasurer of the National AFL-CIO. And first I want to just thank you for what you do for working families. You're out in Wisconsin and we, had, we were in the fight of our lives, as you know, over collective bargaining. Uh, my question is media related in some ways. Um, the American public has a stereotype of unions. It's largely negative. Uh, I often get called a union thug. Um, how do we continue to educate the public in a way that kind of opens their ears to what the labor movement can do for them in terms of economic inequality issues and benefits and retirement security? Is there something that we should be doing differently in the labor movement? Well, Liz, uh, first of all, you do a great job and it's been great working with you in the past and it, it takes dedicated people such as yourself. It's a constant uh, storytelling issue for the American people, the people that are in labor unions. And wherever I speak, I talk about labor, I talk about wage earners because it's the backbone of America. It's made everybody's work situation. It's the standard bearer of how employers treat employees. Productive employees are the key to employers having success. And it's a constant conversation that has to continue. Uh, information is power. And uh, I, the attack on labor since Reagan was president, uh, right now it's at a fever pitch. And a lot of it has to do with breaking up the voting blocks that are so strong in the union community across America because that's really the last great bastion of a democratic stronghold for organizing is, uh, is labor in this country. And it's going to play a vital role coming up here in November as it does in every election cycle. But to answer to your question, information's power. Uh, the unions have got to keep telling their story. The unions have got to uh, keep defending uh, their, their workers and get their workers on their side. There's a lot of union workers in this country that vote Republican, that vote against their own best interests. They're, they're a member uh, of a wage earning community and a bargaining community and they vote against it. I, I find it amazing. They end up getting stumble they end up stumbling on cultural issues or uh, some social issue that they're not you know, uh, uh, really uh, adhering to, and they uh, gin up these ideas as to why they should vote against their own issues. Uh, and we're at a point right now where I think you're going to see a great union turnout in favor of the Democrats because the issues are so clear. Uh, for a union person to support Rip Mitt Romney, it is, they, they would have to be living on Mars. I mean, this guy is nothing but an attacker of wages, always has been, has never been for workers. And the answer to your question, it's just an ongoing process to never give up the conversation, never give up the fight because you have the issues on your side. Thanks for all you do. We appreciate you. You bet. Thanks, Liz. All right. And thank you, Ed, for hosting this uh, Google Plus Hangout. We really appreciate you taking the time and broadcasting on your radio show. Any closing thoughts before we go? Well, I'm looking forward to tomorrow, Dennis. Thanks so much. Let's do it again. <laughs> And right. thanks, thanks to all those hard workers down there who are doing what they got to do for America. And uh, it's for the next generation. It's not for us. It's for the future of the country. And I think that really is what the progressive movement is all about. Thanks so much. God bless you. Thanks for joining thanks, us. Ed. Oh, tell them to watch the Ed Show too. You know. I can't hear him. <laughs>